So you couldn't have known at the time all of the ingredients that went into this. As a filmmaker, I could just imagine the day that she pulls out her box of audio cassettes and says, hey, you want to hear my message from Tom Waits? Or from where? I, I, did your head explode? Because my head would have exploded at that point. It, it wasn't like that. I, of course, have no idea what Laura has. And as a person who makes nonfiction films, no matter what the story is, when I'm considering it, and I assure you every other documentarian I've ever met feels the same way, it's like, okay, here's a great story, it seems like a good character, but oh my God, wh what's the archive? We've all seen films where you have like one photo and you keep zooming in on it over <laughs> and over again. And, and there's no bigger fear than, oh my God, what am I going to do? And therefore, I think now we see, for better or worse, a lot more animation or recreations. You see all kinds of things because there's a reason. There's no archive. <laughs> it's, it's that simple. Nobody wants to watch, including me, talking head documentaries. It's the worst, so we have to cover those heads up, and that's your fear. What are you going to do? Okay, so back to Laura. Here we go. Yeah. So, of course, I don't know what Laura has, and it took me a couple years to raise the funds. So I get a box from Brooklyn, which is where she had lived, and I decided I'm not opening this box until I'm financed. I don't even want to know what's in it, and I swear to God I never opened that box. How long? Oh, my God, I probably had this box for three years in my ah! office. But that's just one box. So the story gets larger. So let's continue. The day we finally get the financing, I'm like, all right, I'm opening the box. Because I'm, I'm not, I, it's not like I could do anything with this. I can't hire assistants, and I can't go to work, basically. So what's the point of knowing? Right? It's just a story that I want to tell. It could have helped you get financed. No, it doesn't work that no. way. Because I don't do sizzle reels. Look at what I have. Ever. Yeah. I, no, I don't do that. So it's like... The film will get made if the light is turned on to go to work. It's that simple. Anyway, we then, me and my assistant, Lucas, drove a van up to San Francisco, excuse me, a minivan. We rented a minivan at the airport. And we go to her apartment. Now, we've never been there. And we have to turn around and go back to the airport to get a full-size van because you've never seen so much material in your entire life. True story. And we made multiple trips from L.A. to San Francisco that year because it was just more and more. And then I found more. And, and that means, once again, thousands of photos. Her mother had been an incredible scrapbooker. Most of those photos you're seeing in the film, if the mom didn't take them, then she was snapping away. She's still snapping today, I assure you, because I was at a reading last night in San Fran. She never stopped snapping. So, you know, if, if it's Bono and The Edge, who do you think's doing all the coverage? It's speedy. It's Laura snapping photos. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable. She had in that box, I know, so I opened the box, right? Super 8 home movies. I'm like, oh my God, this is what I have with Devil and Daniel Johnson. I, could, I know what I'm going to do with this stuff. I don't know the stories that, that go to the movies, but I'm like, I've got beautiful child coming of age archive. I'm in heaven. Great. Oh, there's a reel of tape in here. Hmm, what's this? Got to get it transferred. That's her 15-year-old voice that she's recording that you hear in the film live at the group home that I come to learn that she is institutionalized in. Oh, my God. This is incredible. Never stops. Uh, then you get the videos. Oh, look at this. Stacks of videos. Here's me at my first book reading where I'm hiding in the crowd. No one knows I'm here. <laughs> she's got everything. And I assure you, I'm as blown away as maybe you are right now. Because how can this be? And then, oh, here's a box of, of tapes. I'm like, this can't possibly be happening because Daniel Johnson did the same thing. How did this happen? They find me somehow. Daniel did the same thing. Watch the movie. This tape's all over the movie. I'm like, wow, this is going to be something. And then I went to work and immersed myself in all the research. And it was, it's just, it was just like a, an onion. You keep peeling layers. It was fantastic. I want to talk about perspective because yeah. it, it, my feeling on watching this film is that you were an ally. You were an advocate in some ways of Laura's, her perspective, even in the way, and I think I remember reading this in the notes, that when you see her looking to the camera, she is looking directly at you and other people who see interviewed kind of at a sideline. What's your thought on 
not necessarily taking sides, but who you align yourself with, the perspective that you wanted to bring. Because you could look at this story from 17,000 different angles in terms of what was right and what was wrong and responsibility. What did you feel your responsibility was as a filmmaker? Well, this film, by choice, is a subjective film. And that is all I'm about. I'm all about nonfiction and new journalism. My biggest influence is Tom Wolfe, the man in the white suit, and all of those writers. And if you read his incredible book, The New Journalism, or the article from New York Magazine called The Birth of the New Journalism, it's a manifesto about subjectivity and taking subjectivity and making it more like the great American novel, which they, to quote Tom Wolfe and Gates Elise and Joan Didion and Norman Mailer and all these heroes, Terry Southern, they felt that the great American novel was bloated and boring and dead at this point in time in, by, the, by the mid-60s when they invented, for me, fire, subjectivity. And they were also, a lot of them working at, at big newspapers, and they, you know, there's, they were bored with objectivity, and they wanted to, they all had different styles, but they chose subjectivity, and it became this thing. It was like punk rock, new journalism. So that's my trip. This film, Laura... I mean, her breaking the fourth wall, I mean, that's, you know, Errol Morris invented that, not me. And that was great. And she's the center of the universe. I want her to tell the story. I do eight days with her. And that's it. I'm a total advocate for her books, but this is a true story. It happened, and she is allowed to tell me anything she wants to tell me. And she came to share because it was her choice. She wanted to tell her story, including all of the deceit. And she shared it all. Nothing was off the table. Did you ever feel almost as if she wouldn't have been able to do that had that time not passed? You know what I mean? Like she needed it to settle in almost a little bit. It seemed like she was very comfortable with you and comfortable with where she was, but I doubt she could have done that right in 2006. It, to quote her, she was not ready because she, you know, was banished. She was ruined. And that's that. You know, there was a lot of big stones being thrown at her. And that's how it goes. Uh, but. When I came to quote her, she said, I'm going to let the right one in. And it is strictly based on Devil and Daniel. It didn't hurt that I was a Jew who came out of punk rock. So we had a similar paradigm. But that was it. We all know the secret handshake. Yeah. Um, I happen to know that what we, we do hear little bits of him and we see his piece. Warren St. John was the reporter at the New York Times who really busted this story Right, wide open. He outed her. Yeah. And you talk to him a fair bit, but we don't see that in oh, the sure. film. Can you tell us, I mean, in that it is an important part of your research, what did you ask him about? What did he tell you? What wow. slice of the story does he fill in? Well, Warren is a big part of the third act because he ultimately, you know, un unveils the curtain, you know, brings the curtain down. So uh, there were many people who I interviewed for, you know, fantastic research. Warren was one of them. And we had a great day together, and uh, we probably did like two hours, I would say. And what was interesting is he took me through every single beat of the story of, of the cat and mouse game that was going on between him and Laura. And it was the same exact story Laura told me, mm. and it was fascinating. But what was wonderful for me to know is like, he didn't, it wasn't personal. He was a journalist just busting a story, breaking a story for the New York Times. And what he also told me is that they're now Facebook friends. So the, he and Laura are. Yeah, absolutely. There's, they, they, and they have no bad feelings about it toward each other. It wasn't like personal. He didn't do any, she didn't do anything to now, him. Now, but no, was it, what, ever? I don't know how it was personal. It was just yeah. this is a guy writing a story. He's got a job. And he fell into the story is how he explained it to me. Yeah. It was like what, what the editor hands out assignments. Hey, there's this uh, famous writer. Go, I mean, he tells me this story. Yeah. Go, go check him out. Go interview him. Go write a piece. And they got to write a piece. It's a job. And then it turned out the piece got wackier and weirder. And next thing you know, he's inside the story. And he broke the story. Yeah. This was the interesting kind of, I'll say this was the pumpkin pie part of the Thanksgiving meal, right? Mm -hmm. It was the fact that on top of this fascinating true story and all the elements and twists and turns is that there are also parts of this movie where you bring that story to life with the music and her narration and the animation. Can you talk about your approach to, because it was almost like there's these little bits of a feature film that are sure. wedged in. Yeah. Well, let's just do the meta level that I discovered because I don't know what's going on. It's a true story. I'm just trying to tell it and I'm learning it like 
an audience ultimately ends up learning it. So I'm reading these books and hiding in plain sight in the fiction years before there's ever a Savannah in public, she's writing these books a long time ago, are clues that, she's, that, are, that are in there. Like for instance, well, the heart is deceitful above all things. <laughs> Hello? Then inside the book, there's a great animation. It's like, you know, uh, I have a secret and I, I want to tell, but uh, my eyes stay down, right? I'm like, oh my God. And I remember as a young boy discovering the Beatles, Paul's Dead Clues. I, I used to play the Strawberry Fields Forever play out groove. You should all do it. And you'll hear, I buried Paul. And you'll also, if you do revolution number nine, number nine, number nine, and play it backwards, you'll hear somebody, Paul's a dead man or something like that. It's fantastic. I'm finding that in her fiction. So the, there are many of them, and I, I started keeping a list. And they became animations. The last one, of course, is when she says to Gus Van Zandt, I knew I was writing the future. And we cut to it. And of course, that's the climax of the novel Sarah, which is a great book, where the lot lizards in West Virginia find out that the protagonist, the he, she, is not who he, she says he, she was. And now the lot lizards are going to burn the he, she at the stake. And that became, like she said, I knew I was writing the future. She knew she was going to get found out one day. And it's right there. And that, to me, blew my mind. So what, what was really interesting was finding her young girl notebooks, because she had a very unique uh, telephone hotline addiction calling boys since she was young. And I found pages and pages of hotline numbers. And in the margins were these little boy-girl doodles. So I took those boy-girls and had Stefan Nadelman animate them to her fiction. And that's how the animations came together. So they hopefully narratively as well as meta further the story. Because I, I think it's great writing. 